Uh, I have the pleasure to co-share this session with Professor Mukhtar Matkour, Professor Alaa Shalabi. I think uh, Mithat Abdul Khaliq, he, he, he didn't show, and Ashraf Hatim, they have their, uh, their cause, they didn't, they didn't come for personal reasons. Anyhow, uh, Mustafa Shazdi, I think that he got, got some social obligation. We, I have the pleasure to introduce Muhammad, Dr. Mustafa Muhammad Kamil, Professor of Pulmonary Diseases, I, Muhammad Mustafa Kamil, Professor of Pulmonary Diseases, uh, Asr al Ain University. And he's going to address for us the not making a bad thing worse, preventing complications of ICU respiratory infections, venous thromboembolism, stress, ulcers, delirium. Thank you, Muhammad. Khair and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor and pleasure in Akun for the Jamaia, the Masriya, Egyptian Scientific Society of Bronchology. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among Asad Ziti I'll take you through this talk, inshallah, which will last for 15 minutes. Uh, and we'll speak about some of the common complications that we can meet every day in our in our ICU. I think I'll be speaking in, in English all the time because I've noticed that uh, Simra is sitting at the back. So I think she deserves that we speak in English all through the session. Wouldn't be fair to speak in Arabic in the middle. So uh, first of all, uh, just want to point out that critically ill patients in the intensive care are subject to many complications. Taban associated with advanced therapy, that's required to treat their illness. Many complications are healthcare associated, related to the indwelling devices that we use. Other common complications, of course, are venous thromboembolism, delirium, and stress ulcers. This is just to show you uh, the National Healthcare Safety Network. It's one of the subdivisions of the CDC, showing uh, the common complications that we find in the ICU. And maybe today my talk will go around these over here some two of these and then other complications so as we can see one of the or one of the important subgroups of complications in the icu is device associated whether it's associated with the presence of a central venous catheter whether it's ventilator associated pneumonia whether it's associated with a urinary catheter or dialysis apparatus of course i will not deal with these other modules here First of all, CLAPSI or central line associated bloodstream infection. Of course, the risk is most common with a central venous catheter. The risk with a peripheral catheter is less, although peripheral catheters can cause upper limb DVT. The causes of a central line associated bloodstream infection could be exogenous due to skin organisms on the surface of the skin, could be due to the hands of the healthcare workers. It could be endogenous due to either a contaminated catheter hub or the infusate itself, the fluid itself that is going through the line is contaminated. Last but not least, infection can come from hematogenous sites. Uh, the common organisms in the past few years have shown that there has been a significant increase in the incidence of candidiasis as a cause of central line associated infection and the reduction in staph aureus, as you can see over here. Of course, another common organism is cons or coagulase negative uh, staphylococci. So how can I prevent this type of infection. First of all, educate and train healthcare personnel. Of course, using sterile barriers, a full sterile approach with a cap, with a gown, with gloves. It's not just because you're putting a CVP in that you can just do it with, with sometimes people put it with the only kind of uh, very thin gloves that are not even sterile. Using chlorexidine, which is an antiseptic, I'll talk about chlorexidine later when it comes to ventilator-associated pneumonia, because this is an antiseptic that you can use for a lot of things. It's like Ditol, you can use it on the surface of the skin, you can use it for the mouth. And of course, not every patient will need a central venous catheter to be placed. So, 
Another important group of infections, as you are all were well aware of, are the pneumonias, including hospital-acquired pneumonia that occurs 48 hours after hospital admission, ventilator-associated pneumonia that, caused, that occurs two to three days after intubation, and healthcare-associated pneumonia, which includes, of course, HAP and VAP, but in addition, patients who have been in any healthcare setting in the previous two or three months that have attended hemodialysis centers or have been in hospital have received antibiotic therapy in the past uh, 30 days before admission. Ventilator-associated pneumonia, which is also a very common complication, is usually the sources of ventilator-associated pneumonia or VAP is aspiration, the intubation procedure itself, Formation of a biofilm on, around the endotracheal cuff, contaminated secretions, and of course using contaminated equipment. In order to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, first of all there are general measures, which of course should mean that staff should be educated, and of course measures of antisept uh, antiseptic conditions and hygiene. Every ICU usually there's surveillance for the organisms that are causing ventilator-associated pneumonia. If you can avoid mechanical ventilation by the use of non-invasive ventilation, that would be better. But of course, if you need to ventilate the patient, then you have to. But this will increase, of course, the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Of course, if you're going to intubate the patient, all of us usually use the oropharyngeal approach, better than the nasopharyngeal approach, of course. And then the use of RIAL, if we can do, we all know that when you introduce a RIAL tube for a long time, that also increases the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Preferably, people are talking about gastrostomies now, or uh, as, as much as possible, enteral to parenteral feeding. Continuous aspiration of the subglottic secretions is important. Keeping the endotracheal cuff pressure above 20 centimeter water, but this ha again has a problem that it may cause fistula formation between the esophagus and the trachea. Uh, the use of humidifiers also decreases the, the incidence of VAP. Reducing the duration of mechanical ventilation itself, and of course improving the, the performance of the staff in the ICU and improving infection control. Uh, a word about uh, silver-coated endotracheal tube. I haven't seen it. I don't know how, whether you've seen it in ICUs in Egypt, but uh, you know, abroad they do use it. And it has been found that it, it prevents biofilm formation, decreases airway colonization, and thus has bacteri bactericidal activity. Regarding body position and enteral feeding, I just told you that it's, it's preferred over parenteral nutrition, and the patient should always be kept at 30 to 45 degrees. The use of oral antiseptics and antibiotics as prophylaxis to VAP has been found to, to be of use, but don't use it routinely. And if you're in suspicion that the patient has multiple drug-resistant pathogens to begin with, it's not good to start prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotics. You should wait for your cultures. And this is chlorexidine gluconate that I showed you. It's like an antiseptic mouthwash that you can use to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia when you use it in the oral cavity of the patient. And there was a prospective randomized controlled trial that uh, placebo controlled that also confirmed that the use of chlorexidine gluconate reduces uh, the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia with a 26% reduction uh, risk ratio reduction. If you want to prevent stress bleeding, that's common in the ICU, you can either use sucralfate or histamine antagonists. But they did find that sucralfate was associated with increased ventilator-associated pneumonia as compared to histamine antagonists. Of course, DVT, thromboembolism, I cannot signify this more, you know the importance of, of, of this complication. It can occur up to sometimes 70% of patients who have trauma or ischemia. Uh, usually the average rate is 28% to 32% in mixed surgical and medical ICU patients. Risk factors can be divided into general factors like advanced age, malignancy, recent surgery, pregnancy, obesity, oral contraceptives, hemophilias, and ICU factors such as immobilization, stroke, trauma, mechanical ventilation, central, via, central venous catheter placements, of course, peripheral catheter, uh, upper limb DVT, sepsis, heart failure, and vasopressor use. 
I would advise you to refer to the latest ninth edition of Anti-Thrombotic Therapy and Prevention of Thrombosis released by the American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, and this is a very detailed description of prophylaxis and treatment of thromboembolism in our clinical setting. Uh, of course, we do have mechanical prophylaxis that we can use graduated stockings, or we could use intermittent pneumatic devices. Just to show you, you're all familiar with these elastic stockings, sometimes also used in the outpatient setting, that give you graduated pressure that's highest towards the ankle and decreases as you go up. And these are intermittent pneumatic compression devices in patients who have high risk of bleeding if you give them chemoprophylaxis, and you can use this in the ICU bed. Of course, pharmacological prophylaxis, you're all aware of uh, low-dose unfractionated heparin. You can use low-molecular weight heparin. You can use fondoparinu, which is an inhibitor of factor 10, activated factor 10. Other compounds include rivaroxaban and direct thrombin inhibitors, of course, warfarin and aspirin. So, what are the recommendations? First of all, either the patient is a surgical patient or non-surgical patient. So in order to prevent thromboembolism in a non-surgical patient, pe people who are acutely ill and hospitalized, we re they recommend the guidelines. We is to the ACCP 9th edition. We recommend the use of anticoagulant thrombophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin twice daily, and you can use fondoparinu. However, if this hospitalized patient is not in risk, they do not advise uh, uh, routine prophylaxis for his DBT condition. Patients who have a tendency to bleed or at high risk of bleeding, as I showed you the previous pictures, you can use intermittent pneumatic compression devices or graduated stockings and do not use pharmacological prophylaxis. Okay, in surgical patients, it's a little bit, a little bit more sophisticated. I don't, I don't want to go into the details of this, but what happens is they use either two scores, the Caprini score or another score that I will show you called the Rogers score. And then by giving patients, you know, you, you will never be able to learn this, so you probably have it as a chart in your ICU, where you give him one point for each of these risk factors and you get a total, two points for each of these. Uh, the higher uh, the points, the, the more severe the risk factor, and then you add up a total risk factor score in order to find out whether the patient has a low, if the score is zero to one, then he has, a, he has a very low risk of embolism as a surgical patient who will undergo elective surgery, and then you do not need to give him any thromboprophylaxis. If the score is two, then he has a moderate risk. You should consider using low-dose unfractionated heparin or low-weight uh, molecular heparin. You can use uh, stockings or intermittent pneumatic compression. Uh, the higher the patient goes in the score, the higher the risk. The highest score is five or more, and here there's a mortality percentage of 1.5% due to thromboembolism. And in this case, of course, you do need also to uh, uh, use prophylaxis against thromboembolism in the form of low-dose uh, unfractionated heparin, low-molecular weight heparin, warfarin, activate, activated factor 10 inhibitor, and some, sometimes a combination of these. This is the other score method, the Rogers score, also giving the patient uh, points according to the type of operation that he will undergo. The risk, of course, is much higher in respiratory and blood or cardiovascular operations, lower in usual surgery. This is the American Society of Anesthesiologists Physical Status Classification. The more severe general disease, he gets a higher point. And as you go, also in the end, uh, if, he is, if he's taking chemotherapy, if, uh, if he's taking transfusion, all of these are giving him points of risk and in the end also giving you uh, a score which is if it's less than 7, he has a low incidence of uh, thromboembolism. If it's 7 to 10, he has a medium risk and more than 10, he has a high risk. So I'm not going to go into the details, but as you can see, the, the ninth edition has told us each and every type of operation and what you should give the patient as prophylaxis. And as you can see, it's all about the same compounds that we talked about. It's unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, fondoparinu and active, fact, 
factor 10 inhibitors, warfarin, and if you have bleeding tendency, using intermittent pneumatic compression or using graduated stockings. So each and every one, I'm not going to go through them, but as you can see, you can use any of these in each of these situations. Just a word of notice, if you have uh, a high reason for not taking treatment, high bleeding tendency, of course, you will just be confined to mechanical compression and pneumatic devices and elastic stockings as well. Last but not least, just two slides. Delirium, by definition, is disturbance of consciousness and cognition that develops over a short period of time. It can happen in hours, it can happen in days. It's also referred to as ICU psychosis, ICU syndrome, acute confusional state. There are risk factors for delirium that you're all aware of. General host factors, such as age, an alcoholic patient, he's depressed, he has hypertension, or he smokes, and also in cases of acidosis, anemia, sepsis, hypotension, metabolic disorder. This is all makes the patient prone to develop delirium. Now, let me just two, two minutes exactly, or one minute. I'm sorry that I, I just uh, overdid it, but it's uh, kind of condensed trials. Just one, one or two slides. Uh, of course, iatrogenic uh, factors such as immobilization and medications, all of these are risk factors for delirium. What can you do? You can either there is a non-pharmacological approach and there is pharmacological approach. Non-pharmacological approach, there is a multi-component strategy that I will tell you just in the last slide. You can use a geriatrics consultation, you can reduce the benzodiazepine use that you usually use in the ICU, and you can use these compounds to treat, such as haloperidol and adequate analgesia and olanzapine. A multi-component intervention study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine was talking about the multi-component intervention. And these are protocols that are directed at reorienting the patient, keeping him with you in the ICU, cognitively stimulating the patient, um, and uh, early mobilization activities, range of motion exercises, remove catheters when it's time, don't cause sepsis, uh, use of eyeglasses, magnifying lenses, hearing aids, because if he has a hearing problem, he can enter into psychosis much more easily. And they found that using this intervention, the multi-component intervention, this will uh, reduce the incidence of delirium, uh, which would, would, would become 9.9% compared to usual methods of care. And uh, with that, the take home messages would be that critically ill patients in the intensive care units are subject to many complications, usually associated with your eagerness to treat them. Uh, most of these complications are associated to the healthcare devices, to intubations, to mechanical ventilations, to central venous catheters, urinary catheters, and of course, thromboembolism, venous thromboembolism. Thromboembolism is very common, and I've shown you how that we can divide the patient into surgical patients, non-surgical patients, and how we can protect them. And last but not least, of course, is delirium. And with that, I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Mohamed Mustafa, for this elegant talk. And um, now let me to introduce Professor Islam Ibrahim, Professor of uh, Clinical uh, Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, University of California, San Diego. He will... Um, speak about um, extubation failure and need for intubation. Magesh, I'd like to introduce Professor, Magesh. Professor Islam is present. Yes, yes, yeah. Professor, Professor Islam, Professor Islam, let us to introduce you. Your talk will be uh, extubation failure and need for intubation. Thank you. Session, we can ask questions and answers to the speakers at the end of the session. If we have time, inshallah.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very happy being here. It's been a habit uh, to visit the Egyptian Scientific Society every year. I'm very happy, Dr. Adil, Dr. Tariq, and the rest of the committee. I'm really indebted to you. It's one of the dearest conferences to my heart. Um, I apologize, I just got here late. We were rerouted uh, because of a strike in Germany, Lufthansa. So, but finally we're here. This is what we need to talk about today. Extubation failure. How to predict who's going to fail before you actually pull the tube out. I put a presentation that was about 60 slides, and as I'm sitting in the lounge, I decided to present to my wife and to have her gauge the time. And I found out that I have to take out about 20 slides to make it fit within 15 minutes. So let me try just to highlight some of the home take messages when we work with extubation in the ICU. Extubation failure, referred as EF in this presentation, means what? If I extubate a patient today and the patient goes back on the vent within a week, is that my failure? Is there something that I overlooked? So the definition has to be within a time frame. I read the literature and some people extend the time frame up to seven days. But I think 24 to 72 hours is reasonable. So that means if I excavate today and my patient goes back on the vent tomorrow, two days or three days, I need to go back, morbidity, mortality review, and find out something was overlooked. That patient was probably not ready. What is the incidence of failure? When I was presenting to my wife, she said, oh my God, 47%, that's every other patient. You guys are 50% failure? And I said, no, 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 in good ICUs, it is as low as 6%. But in some ICUs, when meticulous work is not done before extubation, it could be as high as 47%, and this is very lousy. How do we predict who's going to fail and who's going to succeed in extubation? Meta-analysis looked at these, and they found that all the weeding parameters that we use are good for predicting one thing, that the patient is going to have a successful weeding trial. He can go on spontaneous breathing trial for two hours, but it does not tell you the patient will come off the vent. Why? Because there are other systems and other problems that respiratory mechanics do not examine. For example, cardiovascular issues, acidosis developing during the spontaneous trial, airways, Patency of the airways, secretions, all these things are surprises that you find out after you pull the tube, unfortunately. So we're going to try to look at the extubation and the impact of reintubation on patients. Remember one thing, extubation, reintubation is bad. So we're not in the trial game saying, let's try, take the tube out, and if the patient needs it back, we'll put it back in. That's a bad game to play. Why? Because in all the studies, as you can see here, it showed that with extubation failure, patients end up spending more time on the vent, more time in the ICU, more time in the hospital, more death. In some analysis, the chances of dying with this reintubation process is up to five-fold. So the risk is serious. Well, somebody will say, those who failed extubation are sicker to start with. It is not my fault. The patient was older, the patient is sicker, he has a lot of comorbidities, that's why they fail. It's not because something we did or something we overlooked. We also say that every time you reintubate, you re-expose the patient to the risks included in intubation process. Wrong intubation, esophageal, right main, gagging, aspiration, medication side effects, cardiac arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, so it is not a safe game to play. We need to think about it ahead of time before we pull the tube. So when we pull it, we are more reassured that I don't have to put the patient back on the vent. Why do patients fail? Most of the time, it's because of respiratory failure. It is easy to pick signs of respiratory failure before they happen, because the patient is going to have increased work of breathing, accessory muscles, it's going to be hypercapnic, hypoxemic, acidotic. These are just some of the trials that were done from 1994 till 2007, looking at why patients fail extubation. And 
all the studies agree that most of the time is because of respiratory failure. And interestingly enough, those who fail because of bad respiratory system have a 30% chance of dying, as opposed to someone who fails because of laryngeal edema, because that's easily correctable when they are reintubated. All these systems are involved in the process. The patient has to be maintaining well, has to be awake, has to have good cough reflex, good muscles. This is what I called neuromuscular respiratory cardiovascular axis. Who will fail? A study in the cardiovascular surgical patients. If the patient is bad to start with, older, LV dysfunction, anemia, requiring transfusions, bad kidneys, and if the surgery is so intense, surgery on the aorta, balloon pump need postoperatively, or long time on the bypass. These patients need to be carefully looked at and should not be put on the fast track extubation. Don't expect the surgeon tells you, everything went fine, patient is in the ICU, he's in your hands, go ahead and extubate, and he's home. Don't buy it. These patients need to be looked at very, very carefully. What about the general ICU population? What are the signs that your patient probably will not succeed in extubation? Older, sicker, comorbid. If the patient has any upper airway problems that could be depicted, secretions, laryngeal edema, especially when the patient has been on event for a long time. Respiratory failure heralded by hypercapnia during the spontaneous trial. If the patient is working, looking fine, but the blood gases show you CO2 is accumulating during the spontaneous trial, then you know this patient has a high risk of getting reintubated. Neurologically, the patient is not ready yet. He's not awake, sedation, analgesia. He has neurological issues, critical illness neuropathy, muscle weakness. And if the cardiovascular system is not ready, you'll find out when the patient is exercising, ECG changes, the patient might be perspiring, tachypneic, tachycardic, hypotensive, he could be developing acute myocardial ischemia. So these things need to be looked at before you pull the tube. In COPD patients, they found that if they come from home on a home vent, then most likely you're not gonna be able to take him off the vent. If they score high on the SAPS, which is the Simplified Acute Physiology Score, which looks at all these things, heart rate and blood pressure, uremia, sodium, and all that stuff. So if they are sick to start with, again, they have high likelihood of failing extubation. But this is a very serious take home message, which is, if you pull the tube and your patient is not doing well, don't be arrogant. Go back and reintubate or intervene immediately. Because any delay beyond 12, 24 hours has resulted in very high mortality. So the home take message is, do not wait to re-intubate or re-intervene. Now, we do weaning parameters in the ICU to try to predict who's going to do well using all these respiratory mechanics that you're familiar with. I'd like to make a quick comment about some of those. The most widely utilized is what we call the rapid shallow breathing index or the Tobin index. The studies have showed that if your patient is around 50, or let's say a cutoff of 57, that's a good discriminator. Patients below 57 will do very well. Over 57, you're tossing your chances up in the air. Occlusion pressure, which is when a patient is trying to take a breath in, and that tells you whether the patient has a neural drive to breathe. Now, the ratio between that occlusion pressure and the maximum endospathy pressure is a very useful ratio. If the ratio is low, your patient will do bad. If the ratio is good, more than 0.3, your patient is likely to do well and succeed extubation. There is a very unique thing called VERT, or minute ventilation recovery time. Let's say before we start the spontaneous breathing trial, the patient is breathing at 10 liters per minute. During the trial, he goes up to 16 liters per minute. The difference is what? six liters. That's expected. He is exercising. He needs more ventilation. Now, once we stop the trial, put him back on full support, how long does it take the patient to go back down to his baseline minute ventilation? To go down to 10 or 11 liters of minute ventilation. That time is called vert, and it has been shown significantly to predict success or failure of extubation. So what you do is you put the patient on a two-hour breathing trial, 
and then back on baseline support for 25 minutes. You measure the minute ventilation before, during, and after. And then you see how long it takes these patients. In the studies, those who succeeded spent about six minutes. Those who failed spent about 16 minutes to come back to baseline. So that tells you right away, the patient is not fit. His respiratory system doesn't have a good reserve. Some other people tried to measure it a different way. How long does it take to cover just half the difference? Come down to about 13 liters of minute ventilation. Again, the cutoff is seven minutes, and that seems to be very consistent and predicted. But keep in mind, these things look at respiratory mechanics. They don't tell you anything about the upper airway. You still might have a surprise when you pull the tube that the patient had been on the tube for too long, and now he has laryngeal edema. Work of breathing, I'm going to skip it because it is a research tool and it is not practical to use in the ICUs. But there is one point. If the patient has imposed work of breathing because of a narrow tube that we put in the patient, then try when you wean him to put him on some pressure support to compensate for the resistance of the tube. Because you could be trying on a daily basis. Spontaneous breathing trial. The patient is failing every day. He's not failing because he has bad respiratory mechanics. He's failing because you put a small tube in him, and that's why he has imposed work of breathing on top of his physiological breathing. Another neat way to look at the diaphragmatic excursions by ultrasound. If the diaphragm is moving well, it's going to push the liver down more than one centimeter. And that was found to be a good cutoff with a sensitivity of 84% and specificity of 82%. So those who can push the diaphragm down have good respiratory muscle strength. Those who cannot have diaphragmatic fatigue. And you will do this during the spontaneous trial. And that's very inexpensive, could be done at the bedside, but obviously you need to learn to be expert on it. Patients need to be awake. They need intact neuromuscular axis. If GCS score is above eight, and in some other series above 10, that is a very good predictor that your patient will do well with extubation. Now, the, the secret that is kept to the last, which is the upper airway, what will happen when I actually pull the tube? Is my airway going to collapse? So I need to know that the patient is able to cough any secretions out. And the cutoff is cough peak flow rate of 60 liters per minute. And it could be measured easily. If the patient is, uh, has 60 liters per minute of cough peak flow, he has good uh, cough, he is able to clear his secretions. If the patient has a lot of secretions, more than 2.5 mLs per hour, that's a poor sign. That is a poor sign. Hamis had done a very simple thing. He held a white card in front of the patient's ED tube and asked the patient to cough. If there's sputum on the card, that's a positive test. No sputum, that's a negative test. And he said negative test simply means he's not able to cough it out. Well, but obviously there are other reasons that sputum could be more viscid and the patient is not able to bring it up for other reasons. So the simple thing is, your patient is more likely to fail if the cough is weak and secretions are more. Now, there is something that we do before we pull the tube. I want to know if the airway around the tube has enough room for the air to leak out. So what I do is deflate the cough and then calculate how much of the air is leaking. And this little diagram shows you that that space around the tube is going to allow some air to leak out. In the studies they show, you have to have at least a leak of 110 centimeters or mLs. Other studies, they say 12% of your exhaled tidal volume. Other studies, 15%. Other studies, 25%. Anyway, between 15 and 25, the, better, the more the better. You are reassured that the airway is not collapsing on that airway. Another neat thing, why not look at the airway with an ultrasound and actually measure the width of that air column around the tube? That's a very neat thing. Very inexpensive, done at the bedside, but again, you need to learn it and become expert on that technique. What about the cardiovascular system? We have not talked about it. How do I know during the spontaneous breathing trial that my heart is coping with the, with the effort? A very neat thing. They measure carbon dioxide and acidity in the stomach. And the difference between the CO2 in the gastric mucosa and in the blood. If there is accumulation of CO2 in the gastric mucosa, what does that mean? that the blood is not cleaning that carbon dioxide as efficiently as it should, which speaks for splanchnic hypoperfusion, which means the heart is not doing well.
So you put the patient on a spontaneous breathing trial, and you see, if they are able to maintain the gap below 10, almost 100% of those patients extubated. If they're not, then the chances are much less. Positive fluid balance in the preceding 24 hours is a poor sign. And what do you do when the patient fails extubation eventually? Can I get a one minute, please? Thank you. Oh, I thank you so much. <laughs> I was hoping someone would tell you that. Um, so what happens? I pull the tube, I make the step, and then all of a sudden something bad happens. What do I do? We have to intervene early as we agreed. But what do I have to do? Number one, I need to find a treatable cause. I need to find out why the patient failed so I can go and correct it. Number two, on a daily basis, I need to recheck the readiness of the patient to extubate. Then a couple of nice things, non-invasive, positive pressure ventilation is a very good tool to utilize. Also steroids, we're gonna talk about the role of steroids. So number one, if I can identify a specific cause why the patient failed, I can go ahead and treat it. Laryngospasm, we have epinephrine. Cardiac issues, we can diuresis, we can give nitrates, treat the cardiac ischemia. Patient has strider, we can use Heliox. Over the patients, we can use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And it is common in ICUs to actually extubate to BiPAP. I know the patient is, is tenuous. And I'm not going to take a chance. I'm not going to wait 12 and 24 hours to decide to put the patient on BiPAP. I'm going to tell the team, I'm extubating the patient. I know he's comorbid. I know he has chances of failing. That's why I'm pulling my tube and putting the patient on BiPAP right away. So that's a very useful strategy. Some studies, they say it's useful across the board. Other studies say no, it is only useful for those who developed hypercapnia during the spontaneous breathing trial, because that indicates respiratory chronic disease, like COPD, for example. So it is most useful in patients with COPD, but doesn't mean we should not try it with other patients as well. This is the study that shows the difference when patients develop hypercapnia, and the Kaplan-Meier curve that shows how better they do when you put them on BiPAP. Steroids, should we use it? Do you believe in steroid work on laryngeal edema? If you think the patient has laryngeal edema because of any reason, or because they've been on the ventilator for too long, then you can consider it. Blinded studies showed that there is room for improvement here. People who developed laryngeal edema and used steroids were able to reduce the incidence of edema from 22 to 3%. And the reintubation also dropped from 54 to 8%. So that speaks for some success. So what do we do? If the patient had been on the vent more than two weeks, that's prolonged, and you are afraid of laryngeal edema, what do you do? Do the quantitative leak test. If the leak test is not good, is not reassuring, then you are justified to use four doses of methylprednisolone, 20 milligrams each, starting 12 hours before you pull the tube. So that's a recommendation. Eventually, to summarize everything I said, to extubate a patient, you need good brain, working brain, good mentation, good neuromuscular access, patent airways, less secretions, intact cardiovascular system. All these predictors do not really tell you that you're going to successfully extubate the patient, but they make you at least on the alert to care more for those who have high risk of failing. And also, the home take message is intervene early. Don't pull the tube and run away. Pull the tube and observe and be ready to reintubate. And a lot of times when we extubate patients, we have the reintubation tray ready at the bedside, just in case the patient develops strider, upper airway problems. Keep remembering that with intubation, extubation, reintubation, morbidity goes up, cost goes up, as well as mortality. Thank you so much. Thank you, Islam. Thank you, Dr. Islam, for a very elegant, very interesting presentation, which we face a lot quite in intensive care. So we will allow for a few minutes uh, questions and questions, short questions and answers. Uh, so we make it for five minutes, questions and answers. Mohammed, please. Yeah, please. دكتور ياسر والدكتور عماد والدكتور اشرف على المكان الجميل والمؤتمر الاجمل اكشلي اي انجويد يور ليكتشر فيري فيري ماتش 
and um, uh, it was very interesting about the issue of laryngeal edema because this is actually something that we face a lot and I think it's very underdiagnosed, okay? Uh, however, um, usually most of the respiratory patients are on systemic corticosteroids and still they suffer of this issue. So is there is a role for inhaled ICS? You know, now it's very common when you go for any consultation in the ICU, you found that the ICU staff are just putting uh, nebulized inhaled corticosteroids. So does it, does it make any difference? Does it play a role in this issue? If you have any experience, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm aware of using the inhaled the steroids for lower airways, not for upper airways. Systemic steroids, however, is different because again, the dose is you know, much, much bigger. But don't forget about epinephrine. You know, usually a racemic epinephrine following extubation is a very good tool. No, racemic, racemic epinephrine. Spray to the throat after you pull the tube. Exactly, and also antihistamines could also, if you think this is some sort of anaphylaxis or something to do with an allergy reaction. But ICS, I'm only aware of using it for the lower airways rather than upper airways. Islam, I have a question. Uh, how do you tackle the problem of the tracheal column with the secretions and the cough pressure? Because we always face this problem with the post effect of uh, con sustained pressure on the tracheal with the tracheal stenosis, etc. You know, right. you face it in, uh, in practice. So how do you tackle the problem of tracheal column? Uh, how do you... Okay. Well, prolonged intubation has its sequelae, as we all know. And especially when we over-inflate the endotracheal tube cough, leading to trichomalacia and stenosis later on. I don't know if there is a good solution for that other than to be checking the pressure on a daily basis. The respiratory therapists go around with these little machines. We try to keep it under 25 centimeters of water pressure, if all possible. But if the problem develops, it's very hard to deal with later on, especially trichomalacia, and we've seen that. Um, I think eventually, which I haven't not alluded to, is you would have to, uh, to, to, to perform tracheostomy on these patients, especially when you develop tracheomalacia uh, by inserting an elongated uh, uh, tracheostomy tube uh, to solve the problem. Uh, some of the things that also with uh, prolonged intubation is the accumulation of secretions above the cough. Yeah. And now uh, there are the ET tubes that come with a channel for suctioning these secretions. And it's very important just to remind everybody, before they put the tube, you need to suction very well, otherwise you're giving the patient a good chance of aspiration uh, as you pull the tube. Thank you. Uh, any questions, bro? Uh, I have a question to uh, Professor um, Mohammed Mustafa. Uh, Mohammed, do you use the uh, factor 10 inhibitors in your practice? I mean, uh, the Rivaraxaban, you know the uh, Factor 10 A inhibitor in your practice. I mean, as a as a prophylaxis, or you prefer the VKAs, or uh, how do you tackle the point of? Uh, so it's a very good question, and uh, and personally, in my in, in my experience, I've seen activated factor 10 inhibitors in the treatment uh, more than in the prophylaxis, uh, and. Uh, I haven't, see, I haven't seen it that often, although recently it has been used quite often in the treatment. But regarding prophylaxis, I, I haven't seen it that much in, 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 in my practice. Maybe, maybe the, the floor would have uh, different experience. You know what? In our practice, we t we're trying to implement the, VK, uh, the uh, factor 10 e inhibitor. You don't have to, to uh, regularly monitor the yes the prostrombin time the INR with exactly. the fluctuations you know with the drug drug it, it is it is I think very expensive also the problem is yes. that it is quite expensive and if you and you don't have the proper antidote for it if if you develop any kind of bleeding exactly so that's the, the exactly point. but I'm trying to use because it's uh, quite interesting that you you don't go through exactly. INR every yes. week exactly. absolutely so uh, it, it's called uh, the commercial name is Alteplase, I think. Uh, 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 the, the, what, the uh, antidote or what? The, uh, uh, the treatment. So we uh, I think we move to the next speaker, uh, Professor Safwan Badr. Uh, he's going to address for us the uh, gaps and controversies in critical care medicine. Professor Safwan is a. Uh, is a professor and chief of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Wine State University, Detroit, USA. Good morning, and uh, 
thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm really enjoying this conference. It's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a really a great event. Um, I'm going to talk about one aspect of critical care medicine that's a what I call the perpetual controversy that never go, never goes away, which is sepsis. So I will start by kind of the surviving sepsis campaign outline of where things are, and then see where the pendulum is swing, has been swinging. Um, there are very few advantages of aging. One of them is that I see things as they go around and change. Um, and one of them probably I will be discussing is the uh, mixed venous O2. So we start with early goal-directed therapy and what are some of the changes to the standard guidelines. And, and I realize that some of these things may not be applicable to all hospitals within the US, in Western Europe, uh, or, or, or obviously uh, the same applies in Egypt. So what's sepsis? Well, severe sepsis is sepsis plus some evidence of organ dysfunction. The biggest fallacy in the field, and this is the debate between the intensive care community and the infectious disease community, uh, is seps severe sepsis or septic shock is a medical emergency. Um, and, and that's probably, if I, you can fall asleep for the rest of the presentation. If you remember this one, it's a medical emergency. If somebody is hit by a truck, had an MI, or had a stroke, we have a golden hour, and we treat it as such. If somebody has an infection, a severe infection, many hospitals, are, even in the United States, even at academic centers, people will call ID, and 24 hours later, nothing has been done. Now, how do you increase the mortality of your patient? Do just that. So, so this is one critical point, is severe sepsis is a medical emergency. It has a golden hour, just like trauma, MI, or stroke, and it should be treated as such. So the, the incidence of sepsis is increasing, the population is getting older, they're getting sicker, we're taking care of patients who have cancer, comorbid conditions. These were the folks who used to die at home uh, uh, from a variety of things. Severe sepsis mortality is still somewhere between 20 to 50 percent, and, and that is universal. That is actually still a highly lethal disease. And at least in the United States, most hospitals have sepsis programs that they look very, very carefully. And it is actually some of the metrics that institutions are being evaluated by. I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Hard for me to speak. Okay. So the fundamental principles of how we treat sepsis. Early recognition, it's the classic SIRS criteria, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Early recognition is key, absolutely key. Control of the source of infection, appropriate and timely administration, and the last one is the one that I have highlighted here and bolded is resuscitation. This is a condition that requires resuscitation. It is not just simply administering antibiotics. So, early goal-directed therapy, is this is the um, what was started in about more more than 10 years ago by Manny Rivers from Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and actually made it so much became part of the popular culture. Those of you who watch the the TV show ER, they actually the actors on ER can recite the early goal directed therapy better than than critical care fellows. So this is where things were as of a few months ago. We have two bundles, and, and this is the concept that came from the Institute for Health Im Improvement, the IHI in Boston, which is trying to get things into bundles. And if we wouldn't recommend anything to any hospital anywhere in the world, is to try to get things in bundles, which eliminate variation. And, and for those who aren't very familiar with how ICUs work, this came originally from the aviation industry. This is called crew resource management. Uh, there was the, a, 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 an infamous, and you can find it on YouTube, plane crash on the Canary Island, two jets collided, and it was big because of all the human factors. The, pri the pilot wasn't paying attention, the co-pilot was talking to him, the guy wanted to go home back to Amsterdam to have lunch with his fiancée, all that kind of stuff, voila, 
two jets, seven, somewhere between five to 700 people. I will keep increasing the number with every presentation, classic Arab style, I'll amplify it. It'll be 1,000 in my next presentation. But two jumbo jets collided on the runway. That launched in the United States and in all Western countries the concept of crew resource management, which is you bundle things, you create uh, uh, standard checklists. And, and, and I'm focusing on this a bit because it is critical. Anybody who flies with a private pilot in, in, in the United States, even if it's a Cessna, a, a two-engine or a two-seater, will not take off until they go through their checklist. And it's not by road. Fuel check, this check. That is now the emerging culture in ICUs. That's probably the second most important point I want to make. In the, the ICU and the OR and the ED are places exactly like a jumbo jet cockpit. Okay? They have to be treated with the same level of rigor, the same level of a nuclear power reactor. Okay? And that is a huge cultural change that some of the young trainees will see Oh, you're turning it into a cookbook. No, it's not cookbook. It's called structure and discipline. And that saves lives. So the three-hour bundle, which is kind of a bit an inverted way here, is that you measure the lactate, at least if it's available. And not, this is not available in every hospital. So it's not always. Blood culture before you give antibiotics. Okay? The number of times this is violated is huge. Administer appropriate broad spectrum antibiotics and then fluid resuscitation. And I, I keep emphasizing this fluid resuscitation. And that actually is another cultural shift that happened in the past 10 to 20 years. And some trainees are still resistant to it. Oh, we were afraid of pulmonary edema. Fluid resuscitation. If the tank is empty, this car is not going anywhere. Now, the six-hour bundle, and these things are measured. Hospitals are graded by these things. Okay? The six-hour bundle, now you've administered adequate fluid, but you still have hemodynamic compromise. Mean arterial pressure is low. There's still evidence of hypotension. Lactate level is still high. Urine output is low, below 1, uh, 0.5 ml per kg per hour. These things also have to be measured very, very rigorously. Now, where is the controversy? There is no controversy about any of these ideas. The controversy is how do you measure the response? And, and obviously, many of us will measure the blood pressure, urine output. These are fairly easy things to measure. Not every hospital has lactate as a point of care to measure it easily. So the Manny River contribution in, 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 in his classic study was measure CVP and uh, measure C, uh, uh, central venous oxygen. Okay? And that was made as the target, central venous oxygen saturation above 70%, CVP between 8 to 12. The problem is, and as, as an old physiologist, CVP as a spot value means nothing. Because, and I tell my trainees, when they give me, oh, we've given, and it's now CVP of 10, we stopped. I them, have you met my, my uncles? They say, who are your uncles? My uncle Frank and Uncle Starling. Uh, have you constructed a Frank Starling curve? Because you have to increase the preload up until the point, and I don't know what an appropriate CVP for me is versus somebody who has COPD or who has a very stiff chest or, or stiff lung. So you have to actually construct that. But the key thing, the resuscitation has to be to a goal. And another, an approximated way I, I, I tell trainees, which is North Pole, Equator, and South Pole. It's the patient maintaining, making urine, and have normal capillary refill. These are all approximations to tailor things to different hospitals and different equipment. Oh. What happened? I guess I annoyed the computer. Okay. Well, I have to get where I was. I forgot where I was. Moving. 
okay, this is not moving for me. It's not moving for me. Well, I have to know what I was. I, just, I can't see it here. No, but that's not, okay. 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 So now, so these were the guidelines of the surviving sepsis campaign. And the surviving sepsis campaign bundled these things. So now there are always studies that will start examining whether this is of value. And this is the area of controversy. Uh, so now two studies have came, came out in the past year that questioned these two specific metrics, the SVO2 and the CVP. Are they really making a difference? Because that's an added burden in a hospital. That's a huge burden, especially think of a 100-bed hospital, not an academic hospital. So this is one, the, uh, the process investigators protocol based for early septic shock. And these were the, the main point in this study is that they, they divided the patient into three categories and there was absolutely no difference. Whether you looked at the CVP or SVO2, whether you had a, just a protocol or whether you just left it to standard care. And another study that came out around the same time, which is also looked at, and I, I won't bore you with the details, and it's basically the same finding. You can see the graphs, they're practically superimposed. So, we've been teaching for the past 10 years that we need to look at SVO2 and CVP as our goals. And now the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, which is a national uh, endeavor, said, well, let's look at these things then. Do they really make a difference? See what kind of modifications we need to do. So now, uh, it, it is very clear that you do not need to look at the CVP and SVO2 to monitor your outcome. You can look at more simpler metrics, which to me is good news for every hospital around the world. Urine output, blood pressure, mentation, capillary refill, things that we can all measure that we're not dependent on other people. So, uh, however, however, the, and, and also even if you have lactate, even if you have elevated lactate, it doesn't look like it actually makes a difference. However, they have to be like politicians. They, well, it doesn't really harm. So if you can do it, go ahead and do it. Okay? And that's, that's kind of the flip side. I suspect over the next year or two, this thing will phase out completely. So now, is there really a benefit in general from from this kind of disciplined, ultra-disciplined approach uh, to, to critically ill patients. So this is from the surviving sepsis campaign. They wanted to test the compliance uh, and whether it makes a difference. And, and really all what it is, it's a discipline effect. So they defined, so look at the results. If you comply with the resuscitation bundle, not necessarily the, the issue of measuring CVP, if you comply, the hospitals that comply have lower mortality. The low compliant had about 40% mortality. The lower, the higher compliant has about 30% mortality. 10% mortality in such a disease is huge. That's huge. Management bundle compliance now looking for the source reduction is it's not much different, but the key thing is actually the original, the starting point in compliance to the, to the guidelines. The other interesting thing is that for every just participating in the process, even not even adhering to it, was associated with improved mortality, uh, decreased mortality. To me, this is like the Hawthorne effect. Just paying attention to the details was associated with improved mortality. So, if I can summarize one thing, severe sepsis is a medical emergency. It is not any different than acute MI. Okay? It is not very sexy because you're not going to put a stent, you're not going to do neural, neural imaging, you're not going to go take him to the OR. It's all good old-fashioned medicine, but it does save life. And it's much cheaper in terms of management than many of these other conditions. Adherence to protocol is critical. This is not cookbook. This is actually being structured, disciplined, protocolized. This is exactly... We will not fly on a plane if the crash rate is one in a thousand, okay? We will, none of us will fly, and we should not accept anything less in critically ill patient. This is where being OCD is, is absolutely essential. So every hospital should have its own sepsis care program, and it should be monitored, and 
using non-invasive metric is probably adequate at this point, urine output and lactate and blood pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Safwan Bad, for this illustrative talk. And um, let us to open, open the discussion for a few minutes. If you have any. Thank you very much. Very I think I'm a lot of difference. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think the lack of difference shown in the literature is Random care. Exactly, random care. Right. Okay. Uh, the point well taken. Actually, this happened in many trials in critical care. Uh, when, when they were studying ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, even the group that didn't get ECMO had lower mortality than historical ARD as control. It just, you're right. Because I think the whole line, the culture has shifted. Uh, and, and maybe that would, but, but you can still achieve the same results with the structured care, which is the key thing. Okay, uh, if I have a patient with a high CVP pressure, mm -hmm. shall I, I continue and give him uh, fluids? Uh? Okay, well that's, a, that's actually a great point. Um, one of the things I was, uh, I don't use CVP spot check as a, as a predictor of intravascular volume. Because that person could have high intravascular volume, normal intravascular volume, or low intravascular volume because the patient with COPD, patient with pneumonia, patient with high abdominal pressure. What I do is, one thing I was uh, taught when I was a fellow, which I still uh, live by, critical care is like, a, like an experiment of N of one. It's assess, intervene, and reassess. So you are not going to harm your patient by giving that patient one fluid challenge. Or diuresis, whichever one you think, and then see the effect. Personally, I would actually I would err on the side of giving them a fluid challenge, a small fluid challenge, and see if there is a response in hemodynamics. Recently, I had a problem with the ICU patient who was approaching CVP of 18. Mm -hmm. He still looked uh, a little dry to us, so a quick ultrasound looking at the IVC mm -hmm. showed that the patient was hypotensive because the IVC was almost collapsed. collapsed. Yep. And in spite of high CVP of 18, we gave the patient fluids and immediately we were able to take him off two pressers. Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a perfect example of it. So the, a spot check, of, actually up until about 10 years ago, um, we used to teach, uh, we showed a, a graph showing the relationship between CVP and intravascular volume and that correlation was stars in the sky. So, so CVP as a spot check is not, is, because CVP originally came from young soldiers who were bleeding to death young healthy soldiers bleeding to death. So within that model, CVP is perfect. But a patient who has ascites, who has infection, who has COPD, who is obese, that number, who has probably cardiac dysfunction, has high cardiac pressure to begin with. Uh, in the United States, we have a lot of patients with diastolic dysfunction. Uh, you don't know what that person's baseline CVP is. Okay. Now we'll close the session and uh, move to the next one. We'll ask for the question, Dr. Tariq Safat too. Professor Ibrahim Radwan, Professor Khalid Eid, and Professor Ahmed Abdurrahman.